Welcome to the Center of Light on this Thursday night. All my Yana Vites, good to see you, Keith Anthony Blanchard here. Center of Light Radio, Center of Divine Enfoldment and Reinforcement. Strap in all my Broham and Sistar astronauts as we take off our seatbelt and move into inner space. Center of Light Radio, Center of Divine Enfoldment and Reinforcement. I mean that literally. I'm about supporting that which is good that applies to all people all across the board in every walk of life. I usually do a monologue, to use a word, um, but tonight, because my guest is on a limited time schedule, we're going to get right down to Center of Light Radio Business, one of my absolute favorite subjects, and it is partly, I'd say right about half of the reason why as a spiritualist I do what I do. I love expanding my awareness, my consciousness, playing in the arena of soul, the spiritual dimensions. And that's what we're going to be talking about tonight with my guest, Mr. Robert Wagoner. The science and extraordinary potential of lucid dreams. Before we get down to the show, let me give one quick announcement. My literary agent with six books, John Hunt Publishing, Worldwide Distribution. Yay! It's coming out in about eight months, Crossing the Bridge to the Soul. Homecoming, Crossing the Bridge to the Soul. I'm going to be featured in next, excuse me, September's magazine, Paranormal Chronicles magazine with 5,300 unique readers. The magazine is fast becoming one of the most read sources of paranormal knowledge on the planet, triple exclamation point. Let's make it a number one worldwide. I'm posting that link. If you would, please go to that page. Check out the magazine. It's free. You ain't got nothing to lose. <laughs> but also share this. Let's make it number one. It's all about goodness. It's all about, all about expansion. Could it be the very reason you are alive? Is to participate in expansion. Let me tell you about my guest tonight, Mr. Robert Wagoner. Last week, no, a couple of weeks ago, ish, uh, I was watching a friend of mine's live presentation, Kelly Sullivan Walden, and the presentation leads to her radio show, Dr. Dream. Dr. Dream? Anyway, she had a guest on there by the name of Robert Wagoner, and I really liked the gentleman. He was on point, on point meaning it resonated with me. Let me tell you about it. Uh, Robert Wagoner, tonight's presentation title uh, interview is The Science and Extraordinary Potential of Lucid Dreaming. Robert Wagoner wrote the acclaimed book, Lucid Dreaming, Gateway to the Inner Self, now in its 10th printing, <clears throat> and co-authored Lucid Dreaming, Plain and Simple with Caroline 
McCready, McCready, McCready. Both books are in Audible, Kindle, and CD slash MP3. His books have been translated into French, German, Chinese, Korean, Czech, Finnish, and other languages. A past president of the International Association for the Study of Dreams, IASD, Wagoner serves as co-editor of the online magazine of the Lucid Dreaming Experience. I am already starting to sweat bugshot. I'm so excited. I need some water. No joke. This means a lot to me. And why I do what I do. The ongoing publication devoted specifically to Lucid Dreaming. That's the Lucid Dreaming Experience magazine. A lucid dreamer since 1975, he has logged more than 1,000 lucid dreams. That means he is operating at a conscious level to be able to recall them and log them. Robert Wagoner speaks on the science and practice of lucid dreaming internationally conducts online workshops with GlideWing.com. Let me say that again, GlideWing.com, and travels around the world teaching people about the depth and the beauty of lucid dreaming. For more on my guest tonight, Robert Wagoner, you can visit lucid, excuse me, www.lucidadvice.com and www dreaminglucid.com welcome to center of light my guest for tonight mr robert wagner hey thanks for having me it's great to be here we having fun already oh yeah it's, it's great <laughs> robert there's three questions three steps of my interviews one is how did, you get it, how did you get into this knuckleheaded nonsense? Then the body of the interview, and then the final question, which is, what is God, creation, source, inner self, authentic self, whatever. We'll get to that. How did you step on this path of seeing lucidly, being lucidly in your dream experience, sir? Yeah, if you can imagine... Um, um... I was a junior in high school back in 1975, and I was reading a book by Carlos Castaneda called Journey to Ixlan. And, yes. <laughs> and, and as you probably know, uh, Carlos Castaneda was a UCLA graduate student who was studying psychoactive substances, and so he wanted to get to talk to somebody who authentically knew about things like psilocybin and mescaline and and peyote and all that kind of stuff <laughs> so he goes to the desert of arizona and he meets this uh, this shaman uh, don juan and, and so this book journey to ixlan I, I really think it's the best of the of the books uh, of the carlos castaneda series he, he sold millions and millions of books but in this book don juan tells him that he can find his hands in the dream state and realize he's dreaming. And, and so here I am, I'm a junior in high school, I'm reading this and I'm thinking, can you really do that? Could, could someone find their hands in the dream? And so there wasn't any sort of technique. And so I knew about the power of suggestion. So what I did, um, I just, each night before I'd go to sleep, I'd just sit there looking at the palm of my hands while telling myself, tonight in my dreams, I'll see my hands and realize I'm dreaming. Tonight in my dreams, I'll see my hands and realize I'm dreaming. Tonight in my dreams, I'll see my hands and realize I'm dreaming. Do it for about five minutes, fall asleep. On the third night of doing this, I'm walking through my high school hallway, and all of a sudden, just like they're spring-loaded, my hands pop right in front of my face, and I go, what? What? This is a dream? And I was Let so... Let me ask you this, way. Robert. Let me ask you this. When your hands popped in front of your face, was it a... An automatic response and then like you said what what or did you actually consciously raise your hands up because you remembered what you it, it just happened it just happened it, it was like <laughs> they were spring loaded it, it, it was there was no conscious thought of mine 
hey, I need to look at my hands or anything. And that, that's why I love this technique. It's just so simple, and it kind of relies on your unconscious mind or your inner self just to put those hands in front of you and remind you, hey, this is a dream. And, and I have to tell you, it just blew my mind. Um, I had a long, lucid dream. Some wild stuff happened. But all the time I realized I'm dreaming this. This is a creation of my mind. So, so I taught myself this simple technique in 1975. And I tried to convince people I was becoming consciously aware in my dream. But they just tell me, oh, you're having a dream about a dream. Or you can't become conscious in the unconscious. And so finally, I quit talking to people about it, even though I kept doing the practice. And then it was, I was in the university, um, January of 1981. I was hanging out in the library, trying to warm up, opened up a Psychology Today magazine, and there was this article by Stephen LeBurge where they provided the scientific evidence uh, and showed that lucid dreaming was a real phenomenon. And I was so happy. Finally, somebody had... Uh, provided scientific evidence for this and, and so I could finally talk about it without people rolling their eyes. Carlos Castaneda. <laughs> wow. We are so connected, you and I, though we just met. Would you say, would you, th would it be fair to say that the whole Carla, Carlos Castaneda experiences, Carlos, or and the two uh, apprentices, that they were just guys that would hang around, they would pass knowledge, spiritual things, and how to open up doorways so they would walk through them. Would that be kind of a fair summary of what this is sort of all about? You know, uh, Castaneda was kind of a, um, a controversial guy yeah. um, because he, he, he's, he said it was all true, it was... Uh, he was reporting it as it happened, the way it happened. But you, but you read the books and some of the stuff, you just go, wow, that, that's too incredible. But I do want to tell you why I think that he had not made up at least everything in the books. is because in 19, when is that? I think 1993, he comes out with the book called The Art of Dreaming. And in that book... He talks about something that I discovered in my lucid dreams in 1985, and, that's, and that is this thing, which is there's an awareness behind the dream. In 1985, I had a lucid dream where I was uh, doing an experiment, and, and uh, the experiment was to find out what a dream figure represents. And so I became lucid. I asked a dream figure, hey, what do you represent? And instead of the dream figure responding, a voice boomed out a response from above him. And when I woke up from that, I thought, wait a second, is there an awareness behind the dream? And after that, in my lucid dreams, I began to just ignore the dream figures and I just uh, shout out questions to the awareness behind the dream and hear a response. So anyway, I started doing that in 1985. In 1993, Carlos Castaneda comes out with The Art of Dream, and he asked Don Juan, who is this non-visible voice that responds to my questions? And Don Juan says, oh, that's what, I, that's what I call the dreaming emissary. He'll tell you the truth about everything that you're interacting with. And I'll tell you... Carlos Castaneda had to be a pretty good lucid dreamer if he got to that stage where he realized that there's an awareness behind the dream because um, uh, not many people were talking about it. I didn't write my first book until 2008, and, and since then, people all over the world are interacting with their larger awareness and lucid dreams. I love your exercise, sir. In fact, it reminds me of something I have done practice I wouldn't say done but well I would say done have practice and I think it's fantastic and I think it takes your exercise up one more level let me see how this feels on your foot see how this shoe feels on your foot the sole of the shoe fits on your foot so I'm going to tell myself repeatedly night after night I'm looking at my hands or rather I'm looking at a flower that I plucked right so a few nights later or however long it takes one night in the lucid experience, wow, I brought the flower into my experience. If that is true, then it has to equally be true 
that you can reverse the process. Pluck a flower off of a bush and wake up and have it lying in your hands. <laughs> you know, there's um, there's some anecdotal stories out there. Uh, <laughs> and I, I did receive an email once from a young guy. Uh, uh, he's in the Middle East. And he said he had a lucid dream. And in the lucid dream, I believe he commanded he commanded something to come into his room or something. And, and then, then what, then what was amazing is that when he woke up there in his room, there was something that hadn't been there when he went asleep. And so unless somebody threw it through the window in the middle of the night or whatever, he, he, he did not have any way of explaining it. But, but, but in any case, uh, the, the fun thing is in a lucid dream, you can explore the nature of the unconscious mind you can explore dreaming. You can explore time and space. You can use it for any sort of personal or scientific experiment. You know, when I had mentioned just a minute ago that I was that I had done it, I didn't actually pick a flower and in my dream state wake up in my hand, but I did do the same thing, which is as beautiful as a flower, which is when I learned of the presence of this avatar behind me, Bhagavan Sri Satya Sai Baba, there's lots of mixed feelings. I'm not interested in that. I know what transformed me. It could have been a bar of soap, an ice cream cone. It just happened to look like that being. I've always wanted to go to India. I always knew that manifesting at will was real. But when I learned of this avatar's presence, I already had the plucking of the flower, I want this, I want this, I want this, and that I want this, I've always brought to dreamscape with me. One night, this avatar appears to me in dreamscape across the river and begins to talk to me telepathically and says, come see me in India, Keith. And I said, what? He goes, Keith, put all your, your, dis, your logic, your doubt, your disbelief aside. I will take care of it. I woke up in the morning, Robert going, oh, my God. You wow. know that feeling. This is so, re it's, it's, it's more real than this waking state that we call here because it's so multilayered. And I say, Wow. So I let it go out of all the books I read. I said, you know, I'm just going to let it go. Two weeks later, I get a phone call, and that flower manifested in my hand <laughs> from a lady I've never met. says, Keith, word got to me. You want to go to see a holy man in India? I said, yes, ma'am. She said, Keith, I'm a flight attendant. Wow. We have a mutual friend, and I would not like that you, you know, I'm, I have a, we have a mutual friend, and my buddy pass is about to expire the first of the year. Can I give you a first-class round trip <laughs> So my dream was actually realized. It was actualized. Oh, it's, 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 it's phenomenal. It's phenomenal. I, 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 I do an online magazine, The Lucid Dreaming Experience, that anyone can get for free. And, and a few years ago, I interviewed... Can you show Lucid... that magazine, sir? Yeah, yeah. Here, here, here's what it looks like. Uh, here's the print copy, what the print copy looks like. Of Raise course, it up online. a little more, please. Whoops. There we yeah. go. Whoops. There we go. So, uh, Perfect. Yeah. So uh, every uh, three months we have a new issue come up online. And, and about three years ago, I, I interviewed a guy from Seattle named Mike. He, he has a master's degree in mechanical engineering, you know, just a very straightforward, level-headed guy. He, he came to one of my workshops and, and told me that reading my book, my books had given him so much insight into lucid dreaming and, and really uh, reshaped his life. But anyway, in this interview I do of him, he tells a phenomenal story kind of like yours. And, and what he said was one night he became lucid, and there's this guy who just seems to have this glow about him. And I can't remember if he's wearing a turban or something. And, and this guy starts talking it to him. And, and again, my, my, uh, my interviewee, viewer, um, interviewee uh, Mike, he's, he's aware it's a dream. And, and the guy keeps asking him, what is my name? What is my name? And finally, Mike, he said he knew him somehow. And finally, he, he just blurted out, Nanak. And all of a sudden, the guy got a big smile and then started telling him about his spiritual path in life and his spiritual journey and all this kind of stuff. And, and then at the end of the lucid dream, uh, they were saying goodbye and uh, and Mike said he just started to burst into tears and started calling the guy Maharaji, Maharaji, don't leave me, Maharaji. He said when he woke up, he Googled Nanak, and 
he discovered that <laughs> Nanak was the founder of the Sikh religion. He said he was blown away when he saw that Nanak, this guy he met. Nanak. Nanak, whatever. Yeah, Nanak. Yeah, 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 either way. Um, uh, actually existed in Waking Life because how many people in America, how many people in North America know the founder, you know, the religious leader of the Sikh religion? And, and I, I assume the guy passed away many hundreds of years ago in physical reality. But but again, it, it just shows how profound all this can be, you know, whether you uh, getting connected with a, a teacher in India or this mechanical engineer in Seattle realizing that he's actually connected with the Sikh religion. It, it just baffles the mind, but that's the kind of wild stuff that happens when we start to pay attention. You know, when I, when I went to India, on the way to India, uh, I'm on the plane. I'm in North India flying to South India, and I'm first class, and so I'm sitting. I'm already settled on this cat next to me, American, obviously. You don't have to talk to him. You just know he's American. <laughs> he sits next to me, and so once he gets settled, how you doing, sir? My name is Keith Blanche. I'm trying to make dialogue, kill some time. My name's John Doe. What's up, John Doe? What brings you? He goes, what brings you here? And I said, well, I'm going to India. I had a dream, blah, blah, blah. That's awesome, dude. What brings you here? He goes, I come here twice a year. With my company, great, nice to meet you, good night, take a nap, wake up, be well. Four months later, I'm in my apartment <laughs> watching Gilligan's Island, just got bored. And something says, it was during the commercial break, Keith, go get gasoline in your truck. I said, well, I'm just going to do that a little later when I have to get out and Keith, go get gasoline in your truck. So I follow the prompting, I go to the station one mile from my house and putting gas in my truck, Robert. <laughs> putting gas in my truck. And I look over, this is back in the dinosaur days, he was on a, this person was on a set, on a payphone. Yep. <laughs> St sitting on a bike, standing on a bike in biker garb, like, like he's into bicycling, English races and all that, with another person. So my truck's filled, so I start fidgeting around in the hood of my truck to kill time. And when he's done, he said, excuse me, sir, you look very familiar to me. Where do I know you from? And he rolls over to me on his bike and gets a look at me and says, Wow, you that cat that's sat next next to me in the plane <laughs> in India. He was from Washington. Let me ask you this, sir. Because you are the lucid dreaming expert, many people want more of that in their life. Have you ever heard of this product? It's called Dream Leaf. Connor and Alex Southworth have put together this snake oil. <laughs> concoction of all these beautiful herbs and of course they have a sense of humor because they do it in red and blue pills <laughs> into the matrix have you heard of this product but also have you also have you heard of the technique of using vitamin b6 yep yep so uh so vitamin b6 and and some of the b complex of vitamins um there's some evidence to show that they're connected with um, memory and, and kind of mental processes. And, and so, so a lot of times uh, some people take B6 before they go to sleep just so it, it makes it easier, they believe, to remember their dreams. Uh, and, and so there are some supplements uh, that people have come out with that, that, that some people have had success with that helping them uh, become more lucidly aware uh, in their dream state. And of course, to be lucidly aware, it means that you realize within the dream that you're dreaming. You, you, you see something, you know, hey, wait a second, this is too weird, this has to be a dream. And so that, that, that's what a lucid dream is all about. But yeah, there, there are some supplements out there that, that, uh, that there is some evidence of some sort showing that, that it helps people become lucidly aware. For myself, I, I'm just too much an uh, old school person. Uh, I just know that there's mental techniques that you can use. And, and like my second book, Lucid Dreaming, Plain and Simple, is a whole bunch of techniques that people can use that are just mental techniques. Don't have to take anything. All you have to do is focus your mind. That can help you become lucid. So, so uh, I, even though I know that these supplements are out there, I, I'm just too uh, old school. I love it. I love your honesty. And Cal, psychic man that you are, <laughs> Callan Ronando from the chat room just asked, do you have to take something to lucid dream? I don't know, do you? If you do, it's okay. Just understand what you're taking. It can be used as a crutch to get you into a state of 
no longer needing it. We all need step stools, so to speak. I, I've often programmed myself tonight when I lay down, now that I'm laying down, whenever I hear a car pass on the street or my air conditioner kicks on, that's a trigger. So you, you really can make it up. There's no right or wrong. Actually, you do need to take something. You need to take your wanting to be conscious of your lucid dreams very seriously. When you do, by default, you will say, oh, my God, I'm standing in the <laughs> matrix. Yeah, so uh, I, I, I agree. I, I think really a person, if they use their focus and their intent thoughtfully and they read some of these techniques that, I, that I've written about in my books and see how they're used and how people have been using these not only for the last few decades but really for thousands of years – uh, th then, the, then they can become uh, good at lucid dreaming. The, the beautiful thing about lucid dreaming, and, and one thing that I should mention, is that even though the scientific evidence came out in 1980 and 1981 uh, through the work of Stephen LeBurge, who, who was at Stanford University at the time, and also Keith Hearn at the University of Hall in England, the actual practice of lucid dreaming has been going on for thousands of years. It's there in Buddhism, they have what they call dream yoga. And people who go on the dream yoga path have to spend three years in a dream yoga monastery learning about lucid dreaming and how it connects with the Buddhist philosophy. And, and, and as Naropa said, it was one of the uh, six paths to enlightenment. Also, there's a. Uh, um, I uh, think it's a very integral part of enlightenment because, you know, one, it's a motivating factor. You know, I do all this spiritual work, and I do all this spiritual work, and yeah, I feel a little more peaceful, but what is it I'm striving for? And then all of a sudden you get a glimpse. It's like, whoa, is this what this is really about? Yeah. <laughs> It'll light a yeah. candle under your ass, that's for sure. And so oh, yeah. it makes us hungry for more of that essence of what we are in the first place. Yeah, and and what, one of the, so, so it's also in Sufism and in Native American shamanic traditions, in Taoism they have a secret society of of lucid dreamers, and and, and all that kind of stuff. So, but but I remember one thing when I was a kid uh, growing up, you know, sometimes you'd read these uh, books and they'd say, and someone would ask, well, how do they really know this spiritual knowledge about this and the other? You know, how do, how do these Vedic Vedas have all this information? And, and I always wondered, you know, they said, oh, they're incredible people, and, and they just picked it up. But I'll tell you what, uh, Keith, in a lucid dream, when you shout out to experience a concept like, hey, let me experience unconditional love, or hey, show me the basis of energy, and then all of a sudden the entire lucid dream begins to change, and you're shown things, it, it just truly, now I understand how these people a few thousand years ago learned all of this stuff. When, when you're consciously aware at this deep state of lucid dreaming and can interact with your larger awareness, it's amazing what you can experience. And uh, Because a lot of would you stuff... say that it's because there's not so much stuff in the way? You know, right now I could be sitting in this chair and say, I want to have the experience of deeper degrees of unconditioned love. And so I may feel a little warm and fuzzy. But would you say that when we're aware of being aware, and see, that's called a feedback loop. When you curve something within itself, it begins to expand. So, so are you saying that in this place of saying, I want to experience deeper degrees of compassion, that the reason it's so readily received is because there's not so much of the mind and the body and everything that's imprinted in, in the way? You, you know, I, I think that's a lot of it because um, w there's that iceberg metaphor um, that everyone learns in intro to psychology. You know, they kind of show consciousness as, as the iceberg. It's everything that's above the water. And then everything immediately below is the subconscious and way down deep in the iceberg. That's the unconscious. That's the part that we don't really understand and never see, yeah. e even though it's enormous. And And so... So sometimes when we become aware at that deeper and deeper level, not only has the ego part kind of gone away, you know, to, to a large degree, uh, it, it's almost like at that deeper level, you're kind of almost like you're, you're at your deeper self level or, or something like that. But, but, but I know that Buddhists uh, say that, that 
an action performed at the level of lucid dreaming is seven times more powerful than one performed at the waking level. And I think the reason they say that is just for the reason you're saying there. The, the ego's not into it. You're at this deeper level. You have a clarity of focus, a clarity of intent. And, and what you think and focus on, you know, you can get, get to the heart of. So basically, my will is not as obstructed as it would be if I did it in the lower fashion. <laughs> but that, that, that's probably one way of saying it. Uh, but, but that's one thing that I, I talk about in my first book. Um, you know, one of the beautiful things that lucid dreaming shows is that all of us lucid dreamers discover the same principles and the same rules. And that's why you can talk about lucid dreaming with lucid dreamers from Japan or Australia or India or Romania or whatever. It's because as we all go deeper, we're discovering the same principles. And some of these principles are what I call the reality creators. And so the reality creating principles are things like belief and expectation and focus intent. Those kind of things are all very important in this mentally dynamic realm of the lucid dream. Because if I believe that I can fly through that wall, then I can, because it's made out of dream stuff, I can easily do it. Men that I, stare at goats? <laughs> yeah, have right. you seen that movie? Yeah, I've, I've, I've seen that movie. <laughs> uh, but, but if I expect to have trouble, then all of a sudden, kaboom, I'll, I'll bounce off uh, the dream wall. Uh, and so, so you begin to realize and, that everybody around the world is, is having these same uh, realizations that you have to use the mind in a certain way in order to be a good explorer and a good experimenter in the lucid dream state. But that's one reason why I like the, my practice of ignoring the dream figures uh, unless they're somehow very important or energetic. If they're energetic, pay attention to them. But otherwise, you can ignore them. You can shout out questions to the larger awareness, and either a non-visible voice will respond or there'll be just the most amazing amount of creativity in just a microsecond. I have a question from the forum. I want to get to that in a second. But uh, do you know what scanning is? From Kim Gary. She's got a beautiful question. But do you know what scanning is, Robert? I'm not sure that I know. Okay, you're out in the lucid dreaming world and you're a n newbie. Or at least in that experience that night, everyone's a newbie. Because I'm, I'm trying to find my wits in my center to make sense of this so I can be planted so now I can become a game player right so I become conscious it's scanning is I've often found myself into a lucid experience and I'm so freaking excited like a puppy dog that's about to be bought out of a kennel it throws me out of it so what scanning is is okay i'm hyper lucid just if you have to train yourself to be conscious and aware like a practice the same thing i want to see my hands so that as, out of habit when you finally go okay i need to chill out chill out and you start scanning the room and the experience you don't stop to focus on something when you stop to focus on something you're thrown out of it because you're locking you're anchoring it but as long as you are scanning you're free in fact, you take in more information. Have you ever heard of that, or is it called a different word in your practice? Yeah, you know, um, um, that, that, that's something that I always encourage everyone in lucid dreams not to do. Don't focus right. on something and, uh, and lock in on it, because if you just stare fixedly at something for three or four seconds, the dream will start to get shaky and, and it will collapse on you. So, so you're right. You, you have to kind of uh, understand some of these other rules. And again, that's something that everybody learns in lucid dreaming. This sounds so like the movie The Matrix. Some rules can be bent and broken. <laughs> <laughs> Kim Gary asked the question, can I ask you, why do you think I've always been able to lucid dream? I've always done this since I can remember. I never knew anything different. I've been to many places, times, many places and times, and experienced things you can only imagine. Well, that's exactly why, and I want Robert's statement, that's exactly why you're doing it, Kim, because you are <laughs> living in the essence of imagination. In other words, imagination is your default as to why you are just naturally in that space of being conscious in this deeper level of self. Robert? 
Okay. Uh, well, well, Kim, uh, I have a little bit of an answer for you. Uh, I started meeting as I went around the world uh, over the last 10 years. People who told me, like you, that they almost have lucid dreams every night or, or every dream is a lucid dream. They just thought that was the natural dream state until they started talking to people about it. And, and what I found out is that three out of four of these people, when I started to talk to them, they had childhood nightmares and recurring childhood nightmares. And what they learned to do was to become lucidly aware so that they could get away from the monster or the witch or whatever or, or, or somehow deal with the, the scary situation. And so they taught themselves at a very early age how to differentiate the dream state from waking state because in the dream state there were witches and monsters and whatever and they had to become lucid so they could get rid of it. So, so that's about three out of four people. But I remember one time I was, I was talking to this uh, about this and a woman came up and told me, no, she becomes lucid every night, but she just has a neurotic habit. And, and I said, well, well, tell me, what's your neurotic habit? And she said, well, about 10 times during the day, maybe 20 times during the day, I'll ask myself, what was I just doing? And then I'll remember, oh, yeah, I was folding the, the clothes in the laundry room. And then 20 minutes later, I'll ask myself, what was I just doing? And then I'll think, oh, yeah, I was making tea. And so she said, so she'll be in the dream, and she'll ask herself, what was I just doing? And she, then she remembers, I was putting on my pajamas to go to bed. Oh, this is a lucid dream. This is a dream. I'm dreaming this. And so she had developed this neurotic habit to help her become lucidly aware. But I would say that there's a good probability, Kim, that if you think about it, you had some childhood nightmares, and in order to rise above them, to deal with them, you just taught yourself how to become lucidly aware, and then it just became automatic. Robert, I would like to move into what I think is very integral, very important for those who are interested in lucid dreaming. They want it. They've had it. They've tasted the nectar. They have suckled on the divine teat. But God damn it. I've had experiences when something has showed up in my room. In fact, Callan Renando in the forum says, have slept so heavy in the past where I could not wake myself up. Though this may mean that she was just so dog tired, she just couldn't wake up, she went to sleep. This does apply metaphorically to those who are in a sleep that is so heavy when this demon sits on their chest, the first thing they want to do is wake up and they can't. You and I talked about this in the green room. Psychologically, spiritually i'm going to give my thoughts and i would love you to ball bust me or give me whatever support what it doesn't matter i'd love to hear what you have to say it is true and it is not true when you are in a sleep paralysis hypnagogic state what's happening to you spiritually let's not psycholo psychologically spiritually this is me the me that identifies with the meat suit sleeping right and so you either begin to disassociate, to go, or to come back into association. But you're in that in-between state, and all of a sudden you become lucid and conscious. And things feel a little weird, dreamy, like, you, like a fisheye lens kind of thing. And so you're not sure, so you go, well, I'm awake, I'm going to get up. And you can't move. Depending on your doctrine, your upbringing what's been instilled in you oh my god i can't move something's trying to take control of me and there it sits on your chest and it validates to you your thought process your belief and where you are currently in a state of consciousness that in and of itself that is true but also the demon on your chest is true only because you are making it real doesn't mean the demon or the villain is not a real sentient, I wouldn't say sentient, but a real being. You've merely invited something to validate to you your ignorance. What are your thoughts about that, Robert? Okay, so, um, so, so, so just, just... In other words, uh, what I'm saying, it's not this non-corporeal demon sitting <laughs> on your chest because it came from the slew of the devil, one of his minions, like whatever. 
Okay, well, well, well anyway, uh, th there is a wonderful book out there uh, called Sleep Paralysis by Ryan Hurd, H-U-R-D. He, he wrote a great book about it because that guy, he suffered from sleep paralysis. He, he had it happen hundreds of times. And, and finally, he wrote a book about it. And, and so, like most people know, uh, when you find yourself in sleep paralysis, you feel like you're awake and aware, but you just can't move your body. And, and so it's, it's kind of a strange state to be in. And like you say, Keith, if you get too fearful or excited, all of a sudden really wild stuff can be happening. Somebody can be sitting on your chest or you can, uh, you know, have the sense that uh, someone's looking in the window or someone's coming to the room. If you let your imagination go wild, you can have some pretty scary, scary thoughts. But anyway, what, what Ryan Hurd um, discovered, like most of us did, that if you could just move one little part of your body, move your little finger, move your toe or something, normally that'd break the sleep paralysis and you'd be out of it. And then he also realized that if he would follow his breath and just tell himself to relax, he could relax his way out of it and, and then he'd wake up. But then he realized you could actually use sleep paralysis to move into a lucid dream. Yes, I was about to ask you that if he was going to pause, that that you are on fertile ground. to check. Once you yeah. come to a state of center, you start imagining Hawaii, hula girls, South Pacific, and you will be there in a moment. <laughs> yeah, that that's that's what Ryan said. He said he would imagine himself flying over a nearby lake in his city. He would just imagine himself flying over it, flying over it, flying over it. And then suddenly he'd be flying over this lake, lucidly aware. And so, so again, you're at this kind of funny state. You're kind of half in and half out. Uh, you're halfway it's towards it's, waking it, it up. Is, it's, just, it's a very weird place to be in. It's kind of it, like I'm not sure of what's going on. And it, it just automatically creates this I'm not sure and I'm kind of concerned here. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. You know, uh, I, I remember once I, I had this young guy. He was Chinese, um, living up in Canada. I think, think he was a college student. He he wrote me and just begged me to help him. And, and so, because he, he was having sleep paralysis all the time, he said it was so bad that he didn't did not want to go to sleep. I mean, that's how freaked out he was about it. That's kind and of so, Freddy Kruegerish, man. Yeah. So so so. so, so <laughs> So I started po I started pointing out things to him, you know, about about uh, his sleep paralysis experiences, a and then I explained to him how he could flip it, just like Ryan Hurd said, imagine something else, and then he'd find something totally different. A and a month later, he wrote me back, and he was so excited. He said, now he looked forward to it, because now he was using the sleep paralysis experience to become aware in the dream state. A catalyst, and, yeah. And, and and he said he was having incredible conversations. With, he called them the celestial beings, but but anyway, he, he's Chinese and, and, and that's his, his viewpoint. But but it, again, sleep paralysis is one of those things that happens to everybody. Here's what the semi-scientific um, hypothesis is for those who want to know. They say that um, in the normal dream state, you're functionally paralyzed, you know, so you don't flap around in the bed too much. And and they say Fall that off what a staircase or yeah, trouble do down the stairs. Jump out the window, something nutty like that. So anyway, so you're functionally paralyzed in the normal dream state. Everybody does that. And they say what happens is occasionally there's a glitch where your mind wakes up, but your body still remains in that functional paralysis. And then you're kind of freaked out because you know, um, you're aware, but your body's paralyzed and it's such a strange state that oftentimes we get freaked out and, and all. So, so that's what they think is happening. But, but you're right. It, it's, a, it's a strange in-between kind of place. And so it's not a religious thing. It is not a dogmatic <laughs> thing at all. It is a factual thing. Robert, many years ago, I would say 1994. Yep. I'm taking a daily nap. This guy loves his naps. That's like my spiritual cereal. So I'm taking a nap, and I'm facing the wall. That's just okay. a side of myself I'm laying on. And so I come into the hypnagogic state. I wonder if something is going to show up at the door. <laughs> it shows up. And then my next monkey-minded thought is, I wonder if it's going to mess with my head. 
and it comes over and starts drilling on my head and I'm like oh my god what's happening I wonder if it's gonna grab my legs and it, so, so this all began to manifest and though I'm facing the other way I used my astral arms to grab this thing and throw it against the wall now keep in mind I think I'm killing this thing to defend myself this is all just a belief system in my head I'm gonna protect myself to grab this imaginary thing that I created to show up at the door and throw it against the wall and so when I realized it hit the wall or created that it hit the wall I decided to use my arms to feel what it is and of course some part of me felt these sharp shark teeth it can be strange but I understand and I've learned that like you said in your past go around was that when you can think become conscious and will yourself from point A to point B because it's not about moving your body is in fail-safe mode you're not gonna fall down the stairs if you sleep upstairs your body's not going to move that's why we drum up these religious dogmatic things that think that oh my god I'm being suppressed and something evil is keeping me at bay so so, so I, I want to tell you uh, Keith here's something that lucid dreamers learn and, and what I talk about in my book to help people become better lucid dreamers so so uh, so, so like one time I became lucidly aware and here's this angry black Rottweiler just snarling and glaring its teeth at me and you know just like it's gonna you know come from my throat and try to kill me but I'm lucidly aware and I think wait a second and then here's here's what I did and and, and I did it because my good friend Ed Kellogg told me that this always worked for him I began to send that angry dream figure love and compassion and understanding and acceptance and i'll tell you what happened all of a sudden that big rottweiler shrunk down to a little dachshund like we had when i was a kid a little wiener dog and, and then i picked it up and we went flying around so, so i want to tell you here's how you can show that oftentimes sometimes you're dealing with just I call them thought forms, just uh, your own energy, whether it's your own anger or your own aggression or your own whatever uh, fear or whatever being expressed out there and personified as a dream figure. If you send it what it's lacking, if you give it what it, it needs, then you'll watch it shrink down. I've watched dream figures shrink down until they became light, and then the light enter, entered me. You and I are so connected. We need to have a conversation off air yeah. one day, have a cyber lunch. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, when I go out to dreamland, because I was raised Catholic, I love the Catholicism ritual. The dogmatic stuff, not so fond of. But because of this, many, many years ago, Robert, if I go into a sleep experience and the devil himself would show up I would wake up sweating buckshots now when these minions come around I'm like you messed with the wrong guy so what you have said is exactly what I have done and have experienced when these beings come around me I say you better go somewhere else before I change your experience and I have literally grabbed them and begin to kiss them on their face and tell them I love them I begin to impregnate them with what they are not and they begin to dissipate, and they don't like that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, 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 so uh, the, the beautiful <laughs> thing is, lucid dreamers around the world have played with these ideas, and and, and they've learned that that for the vast number of dream figures, especially who are hostile or angry, if you send them love, compassion, whatever, it'll totally change the dynamic. They'll shrink down. They'll become lovable or huggable themselves so so anyway it, it, it's it's an incredible thing and and uh and, and and that's why lucid dreaming kind of helps us see things more clearly because like you say a lot of us grew up you know in our own you know whether catholic or protestant spiritual tradition and 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 sometimes uh, along with that came you know dark things and demons and all this kind of stuff and, and so in a lucid dream, though, when you can use your mind and send them love, compassion, understanding, and, and just watch them shrink, th then you just realize that, wow, you know, that they're not really something to be feared. They're really kind of something to be pitied and, um, and uh, you know, understood. Final question. <laughs> sure. I asked you how you got into this. We had the body of the interview. 
God, creator, authentic self, whatever a person deems that. What is that for you, my friend? You know, um, um, in my first book, I talk about how I went deeper and deeper and deeper into lucid dreaming. And uh, I, I got to a point where I had to go beyond lucid dreaming uh, to, to really understand it. So that meant I had to let go of the of beliefs and self history and and all that kind of stuff to go beyond it and and that's when i began to have some really powerful experiences i'd fall asleep and the whole night would be light there's no dream figures no plot no symbols no nothing just light and and uh, and, and some other incredible stuff happened i'm not going to go into all the details but but uh, but i'll tell you how i see things now uh, keith we all ex- exist as part of an interconnected oneness and so you can call the totality of that oneness all that is or or god or source or the creator or whatever but we all exist as parts of an interconnected oneness and i say interconnected because that explains why there's synchronicities that explains these moments of kind of telepathy of of picking up you know insights and thoughts uh, and, and that explains you know just you know, why they're making pyramids in Egypt and suddenly they're making pyramids, you know, in Nicaragua and Guatemala too. You know, we're part of an interconnected oneness. And so oftentimes the beauty of the dream state is it allows you to go deep enough where you can actually begin to connect with that oneness and actually and actually kind of get into the stream. And and so 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 that that's I'm that's my long-winded response to to your very very simple question, Robert. That's a fantastic. I love it. But I can't let you go and without asking this question because Adana brought forth a phenomenal question. So much so that we need one final thought from you. I'm going to do my best. Don't listen to me, Adana. She asked a contrary question, which is equally important. This is a phenomenal question. Dana says, thank you for the awesome info. You're welcome, Dana. Adana asked a question. Let me find it. The feed moves so fast. Here it is. <laughs> we talked about the fail-safe mechanism of not busting your ass when you're lucid dreaming or when you're having a hypnagogic state. But she says, if we don't move in our sleep, then why have I been sleepwalking? <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, and, and, and so, Donna, you have a good point. That, that in rare instances, uh, we get up and we wander. And th- there's even a report about a year ago about this kid in Norway. He walked, he walked almost two miles into the little village in the sleepwalking state. And a policeman was driving down the street seeing this kid, you know, his little six-year-old walking along in his pajamas. And, and the kid was sleepwalking. He had sl- slept walked that far from his little farm farmhouse up the fjord but but again uh, i and i think what happens in sleepwalking is this i think our there's something going on in our life where we have so much energy we we just have so much intense energy that our body has to get up and express some of it because because the body's going crazy and so i if you look back in those times when you were sleepwalking i bet on those nights there was something going on during the day that they got you all hyped up and you had all this energy that you needed to express because uh i i i but 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 anyway you're right in some rare cases we have things like sleepwalking robert would you announce how our listening audience can find more about you and your phenomenal work that gets me going how can they find you sir and what you doing what you up to yeah, yeah, you know, um, um, so my main website is lucid, L-U-C-I-D, luciditvice.com, and that's where you can see where I'm going to be speaking or the online workshops I do with Guidewing. Uh, the fun thing with the Guidewing online workshops is they go on for 30 days, and, and so it gives people a lot of chance to practice the techniques and and ask questions and share their experiences. It's It's, it's really a lot of fun. And also, um, the other place is at my uh, free online magazine, uh, Lucid Dreaming Experience. And so you can go to dreaminglucid.com and click on the front cover. If you click on the front cover of the current issue, there's a wonderful uh, Lucid Dream article by Karim. And in the Lucid Dream, he meets the angel of death. 
and the angel of death tells him, shows him the six or seven things, the tests that he has to pass in order not to have another incarnation. And everyone should read that lucid dream. It's, it's like an eye opener. It, it, when I read it, I was just totally blown away. So, so anyway, I have a lot of fun with it. But again, lucidadvice.com. You can read about my books, find out what's going on, and then check out the magazine at dreaminglucid.com. What a delight, sir. I really, I thoroughly enjoyed my time with you. Oh, well, thanks. It's a lot and of fun. Learning. And yeah, maybe, maybe sometime we can come back. You can uh, accumulate all the questions that are showing up on the chat room there, and, and we'll just have an hour of uh, responding to questions. Love it. Robert, again, thank you very much. Peace to you, my friend. Okay. Adios, Keith. Thank you. Adios. <laughs> I could be sitting with this guy having a bite of food for hours. Robert Wagner, the science and extraordinary potential of lucid dreams. I would like to also support Adana. Adana, if you are walking around in your sleep and the default of everyone is that your body doesn't move, but somehow you are overriding the default mechanism that stops people from moving, that your will is so strong that you can actually get up and move, that you're able to motion yourself on multifaceted levels. I guess your insight would be to become conscious of your walking around and moving about on other levels. That is That could be considered a gift if you know how to wield it and balance it. In just a little while, I'm going to be doing a presentation on the subject of purge. Purging the collective consciousness. Purge. I'll see you in about an hour. Peace, loving. Live in the ever-present light. Crossover children, all are welcome. All are welcome. Step into the light. Purge. Purge. <laughs> The world is regurgitating. It's vomiting. We are all vomiting. I'll see you shortly. <laughs>